Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. The Mutilated Victory, Italy in World War I. Arriving in Paris in 1919 for the Peace Conference, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson already had a set of deep-rooted beliefs about the nations he would be negotiating with. Of the Italians, he was suspicious and less than impressed. As he viewed it, Italy entered the war not to defend its sovereignty, but rather in a Machiavellian spirit of cold-blooded calculation. Italy's leaders would have disagreed with this assessment, and they certainly tried to convince Wilson that their participation in the war was rooted in a drive for self-determination. Italy's foray into World War I lay somewhere between practical and opportunistic. When the war broke out in the summer of 1914, Italy was a member of the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. This was an awkward alliance for Italy because Austria-Hungary was Italy's historic enemy, and had fought to prevent Italian unification in the 19th century. Italian nationalists also deeply resented the fact that Austria-Hungary still controlled territories populated by Italian speakers. So why, on the eve of World War I, was Italy even part of the Triple Alliance? The overarching answer was that the alliance system that was splintering Europe in the 19th and early 20th century did not work for Italy. A more immediate cause of the alliance was France's seizure of Tunisia in 1881, a territory that Italians had largely seen as Italy's slice of Africa. With this colonial ambition frustrated, Italy joined the Triple Alliance in 1882 and was promised support from the other members if ever attacked by France. The treaty was renewed in 1887 with the additional promise that Germany would support Italian colonial ambitions. Despite these promises, even from the beginning of the Triple Alliance, Italy was a less than committed partner. Italy made it clear that she would never go to war with Great Britain. Italy relied on Great Britain for nearly 88% of its energy needs, mainly in the form of imported coal and this was just one way its economy and security were tied to one of the Entente powers. Bottom line, as the alliance system divided Europe, Italy found itself not completely aligning with either the Entente powers, Great Britain, France, and Russia, or the Triple Alliance of Germany and Austria-Hungary. If Italy's foreign policy seemed schizophrenic, part of this was due to weak leadership. But the other difficulty was that it was actually in Italy's best interest to maintain good relations with all the great powers. And so, in 1902, Italy renewed its commitment to the Triple Alliance, but then also made a secret agreement promising it would not go to war with France. While confusing, this move made a lot of sense to Italian leaders, who realized that as Italy struggled to economically integrate after unification, it would be hard to convince the Italian people to fight a European war. So when World War I began in the summer of 1914, Italian leaders were quick to adopt a policy of neutrality, arguing that the Triple Alliance was a defensive agreement, and they maintained that Germany and Austria-Hungary had not been attacked, but had instead gone on the offensive. Therefore, this negated Italy's obligation to join its fellow alliance members on the battlefield. However, Italy still hoped to benefit from the war. The Triple Alliance Agreement provided Italy with territory in the Balkans if its rival Austria-Hungary made acquisitions in that area. With Austria-Hungary pursuing a war against Serbia, the Italians hoped this would mean they would soon receive a handover of territory. Austria's foreign minister made it clear, though, that this would not be the case. If Italy did not fight, the other members of the Triple Alliance refused to just hand them the spoils of war. Italian Foreign Minister Antonio di San Giuliano worked hard to chart a careful course, maintaining Italy's neutrality while intimating that Italy could join the conflict to support Austria-Hungary at a later date, provided Italy's territorial demands were satisfactorily met. This was hardly the answer the Central Powers wanted. 
and they made it clear that neutrality had its risks. For the Entente powers, Italy's neutrality was a gift. When Germany declared war on France on August 3, 1914, Italy immediately reassured France of its neutrality. This allowed France to ignore its southern border with Italy, which was worth an extra four divisions, or 80,000 men. During the first month of the war, the German army seemed on the verge of defeating France. Italy's king, Vittorio Emanuele III, was so nervous that Germany would win and then turn on Italy that his doctors advised him to go on a Mediterranean cruise and forget about the war. Terrified of the submarine risk, he refused. When the First Battle of the Marne finally brought a halt to the German offensive, Italy's leaders breathed a sigh of relief and felt vindicated in their policy of neutrality. If the Central Powers were not going to win, it did not make a lot of sense for Italy, with its own colonial struggles and internal political divisions, to tie itself to a losing cause. As rapidly as they had come to fear a German victory, they quickly determined that the Allies would now win the war. The Italian people were divided, however. Many did not want to go to war, regardless of who might be the winner. Others, nationalists who wanted Italy to gain territories, and even some socialists who hoped that the war would trigger a revolution, disagreed. Although he was ultimately kicked out of the Italian Socialist Party for his views, a young Benito Mussolini spoke out in favor of joining the Entente. As he moved towards fascism, he argued that national identity was more important than class identity. In the columns of his newspaper, which was subsidized by the French, he called for Italy to fight. He boldly declared, Neutrals never dominate events, they always sink. Blood alone moves the wheels of history. Germany and Austria-Hungary continued to try to persuade Italy to join them on the battlefield, but by March 1915, the Italians were open to offers from the Entente. Aware of Italy's reluctance to join the Central Powers, the Entente Powers had been courting. They started with propaganda, targeting the predominantly Catholic nation with stories of the German army committing terrible atrocities on Belgian Catholics. This produced an effective image of the Germans as brutal, violent conquerors, but it still wasn't a reason for Italy to go to war. In the end, the deciding factor was territory. Britain and France promised Italy, Istria, Trieste, much of Dalmatia, the Dodecanese Islands, colonial support, parts of the Ottoman Empire, a protectorate over Albania, and much, much more. As was common in those days of the war, both sides possessed a willingness to give away territory that didn't belong to them or that they had already promised to another country. They made these agreements with an incredible confidence that all the details would shake out okay once the enemy was defeated. Victory was supposed to fix everything. The end of the war would prove how cavalier this attitude was. On April 26, 1915, about nine months into the war, the Italian government accepted the offer of the Entente powers and signed the Treaty of London. They agreed to declare war on the Central Powers in the future. On May 3, 1915, Italy officially backed out of the Triple Alliance. Twenty days later, they declared war on Austria-Hungary. On May 24, 1915, the Austrian Navy began bombing coastal towns in Italy and even launched an air raid on Venice. In late August 1915, Italy would also declare war on Germany and the Ottoman Empire. Despite Italy's widening war, most of the fighting would take place between the Italian army and the combined Austro-Hungarian army. The Austro-Hungarian army had an honorable but ambiguous reputation. Like many European armies at the turn of the century, the impression of military strength, particularly that implied by parades, dashing uniforms, and martial music, outweighed substance. This was one of the reasons the Austro-Hungarian army was not particularly prepared for war. In addition, it had not gone to war in decades, and its leaders were primarily men who excelled as teachers and theorists, not necessarily men with practical fighting experience. As their German counterparts would bemoan after the war, long decades of peace had allowed the Austro-Hungarian military to elevate knowledge over leadership. 
The Italian army fared no better. Italy may have been new to the war in Europe, but technically it had been at war in Africa for several years. Colonial failures put enormous pressure on the Italian army. It also meant that Italy had been operating under a war economy that was already pushing it into enormous budget deficits by the time it declared war on Austria-Hungary. As a result, Italy entered World War I on the side of the Entente powers but would require infusions of cash and other supplies to properly participate. Barely 50 years since unification, Italy was still fragmented between North and South. The army also had to worry about socialists in the ranks, destabilizing the army's fragile unity. Both sides were woefully unprepared for war. And yet, although the Italian front is often dismissed in the story of World War I, Italy's decision to fight would have major repercussions in the region. Given the terrain between the two countries, the Isonzo River Valley was the only place to conduct large-scale operations. It also had a large Italian-speaking population, which was attractive to Italy's leaders as they sought to cast the still relatively unpopular war as a war of liberation. However, the river itself presented a problem. In order to cross it, the Italians needed to neutralize the Austrian troops in the mountains above. But in order to neutralize the Austrian troops, the Italians needed to cross the river. This was a conundrum. To make matters worse, the Austrians had also fortified their positions and were prepared to defend at all costs. Throughout the war, Italy maintained numerical superiority, but this advantage would generally be negated by the fact that the mountains favored defense and tended to be a force multiplier for the Austrians. Ultimately, the Isonzo region would play host to a dozen battles during the war. The first battle of the Isonzo began on June 23, 1915. Under the direction of Italian Chief of Staff General Luigi Cadorna, for two weeks the Italian army attempted to cross the river and dislodge the Austrians from the mountains above. They made minor gains but ultimately failed. Eleven days later, they tried again in the second battle of the Isonzo. Like his counterparts on the Western Front, Cadorna still hoped to smash through his enemy's defenses with a frontal assault. This strategy failed, and despite numerical superiority, the Italian army suffered high casualties and achieved little. The Third Battle of the Isonzo began in October 1915, after the Italians had managed to scrape together enough artillery shells and other supplies. It would be similar to the first two battles. This time, the main target was the town of Gorizza. Taking a page from the developments in the Western Front, Cadorna decided to rely more on artillery to support the advance of his troops. However, the result was the same. Despite artillery support, the Italian troops were spread too thin, and after repeated attacks, the Austro-Hungarian army held their ground. A week later, on November 10, 1915, Cadorna launched the Fourth Battle of the Isonzo. After three weeks of fighting, this offensive was abandoned. It was yet another failure with massive casualties on both sides. With the Fourth Battle of the Isonzo over, both sides dug in for winter. Under extreme pressure from his French counterparts to relieve some of the pressure on Verdun, Cadorna launched the Fifth Battle of the Isonzo in March 1916. The offensive was quickly halted five days later due to poor weather. In addition to weather, the Italian army had been unprepared and lacked many basic supplies. Whatever gains they made in this battle were quickly lost when the Austrian army lobbed gas shells at their positions and the Italians were forced to retreat. Fighting continued, and in May of 1916, the Austrians launched a massive offensive on the Trentino front. Cadorna had anticipated this because of intelligence reports about new divisions being sent to that area. But the general in that sector, Roberto Brusati, ignored his warnings. Predictably, the Italians were pushed back. 30,000 of them were taken prisoner, and over the course of the month, the Austrians were able to push the Italian army back 12 miles. Then, as so often had happened with the Italians, the Austrians were halted by the mountainous terrain. Their offensive had been fairly successful, though. In response, Cadorna called upon his Russian counterparts 
to begin an offensive in the east that would help draw off the Austro-Hungarian troops. On August 6, 1916, with the Trentino front somewhat stabilized, Cadorna launched the Sixth Battle of the Isonzo. This time the Italians met with success. With the Austro-Hungarian army exhausted after Trentino and facing the Russians in the east, Cadorna was finally able to take several mountaintops and the prized town of Gorica. By the time the offensive was halted, the Italians suffered 50,000 casualties, gained several miles, and had captured 50,000 Austrian troops. In an attempt to capitalize on the success of the Sixth Battle, the Seventh Battle of the Isonzo commenced on September 14, 1916. Three days later, after heavy casualties, the offensive was called off. Several mountaintops had been captured, but the Austrians held. This time, however, there were signs that the Italian offensives were beginning to wear down the Austro-Hungarian army. Among the Central Powers, there was a definite fear that without reinforcements, the Italians might eventually break through. The Eighth Battle of the Isonzo began on October 10, 1916. Its objectives were the same as the Seventh Battle of the Isonzo, and similarly, within several days, it too was halted in the face of heavy casualties. It was followed up by the Ninth Battle of the Isonzo. It too only lasted a few days before being called off due to poor battlefield conditions. Struggling against deep mud, the Italians managed to take 9,000 Austrian soldiers captive, but more men filled their places. Overall, the 7th, 8th, and 9th Battles of the Isonzo failed to capitalize on the successes of the 6th Battle. The Italians suffered 75,000 casualties to the Austro-Hungarian count of 63,000 casualties. Exhausted, both armies dug in for the winter. During this break, an accident on the Isonzo sector wounded then-Sergeant Benito Mussolini. He was evacuated to a hospital where he recuperated over the course of six months. When he recovered, he returned to journalism and completed his conversion to fascism. On May 12, 1917, the 10th Battle of the Isonzo began. Under pressure from his allies on the Western Front, Cadorna sent 38 Italian divisions against 14 Austro-Hungarian ones. Initially, things went well, and within weeks the Italian army was near Trieste and other objectives. Italian soldiers were under no illusion that success was in their grasp this time, though. A popular soldier's jingle of the time proclaimed, General Cadorna wrote to the Queen, If you want to see Trieste, buy a postcard. Their skepticism was warranted. Within weeks, a major Austro-Hungarian counteroffensive canceled out the Italian army's gains, ending the Tenth Battle of the Isonzo. As usual, casualties were high, 157,000 for the Italians and 75,000 for the Austro-Hungarians. In the face of such stalemate and high casualties, it is not surprising that morale among the Italian army was low and desertion was rising. Two months later, in an attempt to break through and raise morale, Cadorna gathered his largest army yet and launched the 11th Battle of the Isonzo. Beginning in August 1917, this battle was initially so successful that the Italians took miles of territory but had to stop when they outran their supply lines. Despite this success, an estimated 10,000 troops deserted between July and August 1917. Desertions aside, Cadorna had another problem. Concerned that Germany was going to help the Austro-Hungarians with a major offensive, Cadorna ordered his generals to retreat to more defensive positions. To this point, the Italian army had almost been exclusively arrayed for offense, and this transition to a defensive posture was poor. In particular, near Caporetto, General Luigi Capello, the confident hero of the successful Sixth Battle of the Isonzo, disobeyed Cadorna's order, paving the way for disaster. The Twelfth Battle of the Isonzo, or Caporetto as it is known, began on October 24, 1917. This time, with the help of its German ally, Austria-Hungary launched an offensive. It began with an intense artillery bombardment that included gas shells. 
Lacking protective equipment, the Italian soldiers fled back more than 10 miles to the town of Caporetto. By nightfall, German forces entered Caporetto. The next day, the Central Powers continued their drive forward, and one young German lieutenant, Erwin Rommel, using new stormtrooper tactics, led his men on a speedy advance over the course of several days that captured 9,000 Italian soldiers at a cost of six men killed. Caporetto was a disaster for the Italians and forced their army to retreat back to the Piave River. The Central Powers claimed success at a cost of 70,000 casualties. The Italians suffered 10,000 killed, 30,000 wounded, 50,000 deserters, and 265,000 captured. Many of those captured had willingly surrendered. To international observers, it seemed Caporetto might knock Italy out of the war. This disaster led to a new Italian government, the sacking of Cadorna, and his replacement by General Armando Diaz. The new Prime Minister, Vittorio Orlando, immediately requested aid from the British and French. The Italians reported they were facing overwhelming numbers of Austro-Hungarian soldiers. Their estimate was so obviously exaggerated that the French and British decided that the Italian general staff and government were too overcome by panic to be an effective ally. Fearful, though, of what might happen if the Italian public deserted the cause, British military intelligence even sought out Mussolini, who was one of the voices speaking out against defeatism. They financed his newspaper. The French and British also sent eight divisions to assist on the Italian front. In the end, however, it would be the Italians themselves who would stave off total collapse. With the great success of Caporetto, the German army switched gears to focus on their coming spring offensive on the Western Front. This largely left the Austro-Hungarian army to finish mopping up on the Italian front. They were not as good at this as the Germans. Poor planning and operation security would doom this final Austro-Hungarian offensive. With the Austro-Hungarians coming ever closer to Venice, the Italian army halted troops trying to cross the Piave River on November 15, 1917. The Allies pushed General Diaz to counter quickly and destroy the Austro-Hungarian army, but he stayed put, realizing that his forces were not in any shape to counter. The Italian army eventually went on the offensive in October 1918. Despite both armies being affected by the influenza epidemic, Diaz assembled 57 divisions, including two French and three British divisions, plus one American regiment. The Austro-Hungarian army had 52 divisions, six of which were cavalry divisions. Diaz targeted the town of Vittorio in the Veneto region. The goal was to capture Vittorio and split the Austro-Hungarian army. On October 24, 1918, the one-year anniversary of Caporetto, the Italian army began an attack that was designed to draw the Austro-Hungarian reserves into play. As the Italians advanced towards Vittorio, the heterogeneous Austro-Hungarian empire began to crumble politically. The Czechs declared independence and more defections followed. In response, the Austro-Hungarian command called for a general retreat. Then, on October 31, 1918, Hungary formally withdrew from the empire. As it crumbled, Italian troops continued to advance, and on November 3, 1918, Austria signed an armistice ending the hostilities. Under the terms of the armistice, the Italians occupied many of the territories they craved. With the success at Vittorio Veneto, the war on the Italian front ended. This final battle came at a cost of a combined 37,000 killed and 73,000 wounded. One week later, with the collapse of their ally, along with their own internal divisions, Germany also requested an armistice. Italian leaders arrived at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 with the belief that the Treaty of London was a valid agreement. They had fought as promised, and they won. They fully expected to gain the territories they were promised. British and French leaders arrived at the peace conference under the belief that the treaty was an embarrassment and that Italy's contributions on the battlefield had been limited. 
Woodrow Wilson arrived with the conviction that the Treaty of London was a vestige of old diplomacy and not how things would be done in the new world that he hoped to shape. Many nations would walk away from the peace conference with a sense of deep dissatisfaction and resentment that would bleed into their national psyches for decades to come, leading to major political consequences in the future. Italy was one of those states. It was impossible to have any standing at the negotiating table without a strong economy and a highly capable military. In the end, victory wasn't the ultimate panacea. For Italy, it did not mean anything without the support of the other major powers, France, Great Britain, and the United States. Italy would not receive many of the territories it wanted, nor would it receive support for its colonial ambitions. The disappointments of Versailles would lead Italian poet Gabriele D'Annunzio to refer to Italy's victory as Vittorio Mutilata, the mutilated victory. Italy fundamentally contributed to the Allied victory. It entered into the war in a desperate hope to resolve internal divisions through conquest. Ironically, Austria-Hungary was similarly motivated by 1918 and was desperate to stave off its own political disintegration through battlefield victories. However, the incredible loss and costs of fighting on the Italian front would bring both nations to their knees. A lack of victory would destroy Austria-Hungary, and a mutilated victory would send Italy into the arms of Mussolini and fascism in 1922. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.